Hello there, people. Uh, Occupy Harvard. Tell me what democracy looks like. This is what democracy looks like. Tell me what democracy looks like. This is what democracy That's looks good. like. That's good. That's terrific. It's really great to see uh, Occupy Harvard looking so strong. Uh, for some time, it's been thought uh, within the Occupy movement that the Occupy colleges phase of the movement would be the wintering phase, uh, like the Valley Forge of the revolution in a way. And, um, and it's great to see the momentum uh, keeping up here. And if, it is, uh, if Occupy is going to be a revolution, then for sure it's going to be a very long one. And, uh, and let me explain why. Um, I spent the last few hours uh, actually talking to the project on uh, justice, welfare, and economics here at Harvard, and I was describing my own transition, which is not unusual, I think, my own transition from being uh, a neighbor, a residential neighbor down in the near the financial district in lower Manhattan uh, to being a participant, to being an organizer. And all of these things happen in very rapid succession because uh, it's very easy to get pulled into the orbit uh, of the Occupy movement, as I'm sure many of you know. Uh, but although that happened very rapidly, I also feel that this is, uh, this is a movement I've been waiting for for 30 years. And, uh, and I'm certainly not alone in that. Um, I, uh, I share this feeling with many folks of my vintage. I had the misfortune of uh, arriving in this country just a couple of months before Ronald Reagan was elected uh, in 1980. And, and really, I feel as if pretty much we've been going downhill ever since, uh, at least until this year. And uh, to put it in the perspective of Occupy, uh, that last 30 years has belonged to Wall Street. And the next 30 years, if we get it right, the next 30 years can and should belong to us. And uh, so let's make sure that we're able to say decades hence that we were here at the origin uh, when the rotting vessels of the neoliberal fleet were turned around and sent to the shipbreakers. Let's make sure that even a year from now, we won't be lamenting about how this movement got channeled into and was co-opted by the presidential election of 2012. Let's make sure that on campuses it doesn't wither away, as student mobilizations often do uh, during intersessional breaks and especially during the long uh, summer break. Let's make sure that the logic of the movement gets rolled out space after space and in institution after institution into every civic molecule of our society in much the same way that neoliberalism became pervasive in every civic, civic molecule of our society for the last 30 years or so, or over the last 30 years. Let's also make sure that we don't underestimate the resurgent power of the right wing to siphon off a lot of the populist potential of the 99% claim. They have been suspiciously quiet of late, and that's never a good sign, and you can be sure that they are uh, plotting some plan, or some plan is afoot to steal the plot. Now, I've been invited here mostly to talk about the Occupy Student Debt Campaign uh, that my uh, OWS working group uh, launched recently. And uh, so I want to begin by asking how many of you have student debt here? That's quite a lot for Harvard. Uh, Harvard has very, very low levels of student debt nationally. It's quite exceptional in that regard. How many of you think that those debts may well be unpayable in your lifetimes? How many of you think that colleges shouldn't be funded by requiring students to go into debt bondage? How many of you think public institutions should be tuition free? That student loans should be interest free? How many of you think that private universities like Harvard and, and for-profit universities should open their books? How many of you think that the powers that be have the moral obligation to cancel debt when it becomes unpayable? Pretty good numbers, I'd say. 
Well, these, uh, these beliefs, which seem to be widely shared here, are not just the pet concerns of Harvard liberals. They're not just the bread and butter of the Occupy regulars. I think they're widely shared beyond this movement and in the public mind. And they've been rising to a climax for some years now as the volume of student debt has steadily risen. And why has it steadily risen? Last year, as some of you know, the volume of student debt surpassed consumer debt in this country for the first time. And there were a lot of people on Wall Street who were raising their champagne glasses when that happened. There'll be a lot more raising their champagne glasses when the volume of student debt surpasses the one trillion dollar mark, which it will do, scheduled to do in the next few weeks or so, or by the end of the calendar year. Um, <coughs> And uh, the toasts, when the champagne glasses are raised, the toast will be to a system that allows them to freely exploit the fresh desires of 18-year-olds to pursue the education of their dreams. So it's on the basis of these beliefs that we built our campaign. Uh, but first of all, uh, we were motivated by debtors' stories, very painful stories about their plight. And since the very first days of the Occupy movement, uh, there, the student debt has been a constant refrain. I mean, not just down at Zuccotti Park, but at all Occupy locations and at Occupy websites. Uh, we've heard truly a harrowing testimony about the agony of student debt, about the suffering and humiliation of people who simply cannot pay their debts. And these are not stories about consumer debt. Because education is not like buying a car or like buying a flat screen TV. I think most educators would agree with that. These are stories about people who have had to enter into debt bondage in order to win a chance to get a decent job, uh, which they've been told they had to do to get some kind of slot in the knowledge economy. A job that takes knowledge skills seriously. We know that financial speculators have destroyed that jobs economy. We also know that they've left you know, graduates unemployed and in hock for decades to come. At the same time, these financial speculators have, it, have profited very handsomely from the student lending racket. And I call it a racket because it really is a racket. Student loans are um, among the most lucrative loans you can make in the financial industry, and that's largely because lawmakers have stripped any consumer protections and rights from the debtors themselves, alone among all other debtors. Student debtors have no rights or protections. And on the other side, lawmakers have given extraordinary powers of extraction to the creditors, to the lenders, uh, uh, powers that extend unto the grave and even beyond the grave. The federal government has been complicit in enabling these rapacious profits, and it has also perpetuated the unfair terms on which federal loans themselves are now offered, or are still offered. Our public universities, once the democratic gold standard worldwide, are increasingly and ruinously dependent on the debt financing from the very people they're supposed to serve as are the salaries of university teachers, including my own. And this is a point of recognition for me. I've, I've known for some time that my salary in part depends on my students going into debt for decades to come. But uh, like most faculty, I chose not to dwell on this fact. There's, there is a wall of denial around this, and that has to change for university faculty and teachers. There it really is no justice in, uh, in a system that currently exists which invites profiteering on the part of lenders, encouraging them to exploit in a frankly predatory manner um, uh, those who, who the system is supposed to serve. So um, our campaign, uh, and you can find it uh, uh, fully described at OccupyStudentDebtCampaign.org, it's built around a debtor's pledge of refusal, whereby signatories pledge to stop their loan payments after one million others have signed on. 
Until that one million mark is reached, the signers, in essence, are participating in a debt strike threat. It's also supported, the, the debtor's pledge is supported by fraternal pledges from faculty. There's a faculty pledge of support and also a non-debtor's pledge of support. Now, we devised this pledge to offer uh, an action alternative to debtors who currently are suffering the debilitating consequences of debt and default in personal isolation. They're already suffering this. Mass default is already happening with or without an initiative like this. What we were offering, we thought, through uh, launching this campaign is, um, is offering debtors a chance to engage in a public act of dissent, uh, an empowering act, and in a way that could contest the outcome of their debt, ultimately, if it had a, potential, if it had a political and public impact. Um, and so, like others in the Occupy movement, we believe that actions are important, that actions are empowering, and, um, and, and therefore the, uh, the campaign isn't posed as a set of demands. And we, we, we observe the no demands ethos of the Occupy movement. We don't believe that uh, demands can be adequately addressed by the political system that currently exists, at least not while it's under the baleful influence of corporate dollars. So um, we believe that debt strikes and debt jubilees in particular are the only justifiable response to this uh, two decades of predatory lending that has enriched the 1%. And especially so if you consider that for most students, the only way they're going to be able to pay off their debts, if at all, will be to go and work in the finance industry itself, in which case they will be, they'll be asked to turn around and, and, and prey upon their their younger brethren in the lending in, through the lending industry. There's some irony there. So uh, the pledge of refusal that's in the campaign rests on four principles, and I'll just describe them briefly. Public education should be publicly funded, as it used to be in the U.S., especially in states like California and, and New York, uh, where we're really talking about uh, a restoration of the status quo. And so public funding, and, so, and the U.S. can join the list of countries around the world, all of them less affluent than us, that manage to provide free public education at the tertiary level. The GI Bill, great historical precedent in this country, the GI Bill uh, gave a free public education to tens of millions of Americans and, and really helped to jumpstart uh, the, the golden age of American higher education. Now, according to a recent estimate, uh, it would take a little more than $70 billion, billion dollars to, um, for the federal government to cover the tuition of uh, students enrolled at all two- and four-year colleges in this country. And $70 billion is really a tiny slice of the federal budget. Uh, just to put it in a perspective, um, uh, there was a recent audit that, that showed that the Pentagon wastes $70 billion every year in unaccountable spending. This is, this is uh, Pentagon spending that just disappears, is off the books somewhere. That alone could fund every uh, public college and university in this country. Second principle, unlike consumer loans, student loans should be interest-free. They should not be packaged as if they were consumer credit. Currently, federal loans are offered at interest rates that are well above those of home mortgage loans and far above the rate at which the government itself borrows money. There's no justification for this. There's no rationale for our government treating education as if it was a high return investment on the part of government agencies. Uh, and, they should, and the government should not allow banks to do so either. Thirdly, uh, we believe that Private universities and for-profit colleges should adopt fiscal transparency. They depend increasingly on federal loans, federal student loans. They enjoy tax-exempt status, and they are beneficiaries of huge amounts of federal largesse in all sorts of ways. Why should institutions that could not exist without massive taxpayer subsidies have a fundamental right to shield their budgets from public scrutiny. 
Students have a fundamental right, we believe, to know where their tuition dollars are being spent and are allocated. That way we might have some idea of how and why the costs of a college education in this country have been soaring. I can tell you one thing, it's not because faculty salaries have been soaring. <laughs> over, that same pe over the same period that tuition at colleges in this country have skyrocketed, uh, the instructional costs at colleges have been sliced considerably, largely because of the casualization of the professional workforce in, uh, in teaching institutions around the country. Almost 75% of college teaching now is done by adjuncts or contingent labor, many of whom qualify for food stamps on the basis of their annual income. So that, those, those soaring costs certainly are not, are, are, are not, uh, are not benefiting faculty in any, uh, in any systematic way. Lastly, we believe that the current student debt burden should be written off. Historically, as part of the debt jubilee tradition, new dynastic rulers have canceled the debts of the people, both uh, to proclaim or to announce the start of some new regime, but also in recognition of the fact that the debts are simply unpayable. And if you think this is something that only happened in Mesopotamia, consider <laughs> Consider how many astronomically high debts have been written off in the last five years. Not only the debts of huge financial institutions like AIG, but also the national debts of some large European countries. A recent estimate some of you may have seen showed that perhaps the true cost of the bank bailouts uh, of a few years ago was as much as $7 trillion. How much of that $7 trillion was simply debts that were written off, magically made to disappear, wiped clean or else absorbed by the treasury. Sure, we'll buy all that bad debt from you. No problemo. So yes, if you are big and powerful enough, your debts can get written off. But if you're a student debtor, forget about it. You're not even allowed to declare bankruptcy. Now there's a lot of moralism around debt. That's part of the problem. I mean, historically, people on both sides of the debt contract usually are seen as immoral, right? Lenders, <laughs> lenders are immoral, debtors are immoral, you put them in prisons, debtors' prisons, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of moralism around debt. But really, uh, it seems to me that the only truly moral response to predatory lending is to refuse to pay it back, collectively and publicly. The alternative is to allow the plunder to continue, to allow lenders to continue to use higher education as a profit engine. Occupy student debt, my friends. Occupy student debt. That's what I'm here to say. Thank you. So we have time for a few questions. Again, try to keep them brief. Hi. Um, don't you think that this problem should be addressed by wages and private sector unions and sure. not um, through the cost of tuition or debt um, relief? I'm sorry, I didn't really hear your question. Shouldn't this be addressed by an increase in wages so when um, students get out of school or before, if they choose not to go to school, that it's really the wages have remained so low in proportion to the growth of the cost of education, that um, if wages were increased, so if you worked at McDonald's, for instance, maybe you get $25, $30 an hour, um, then you could decide if you wanted to go to college or you didn't want to go to college, or you could start a business, or, you know, because it seems to me the conversation, the right always says, um, you know, not everybody should go to college, and liberal arts college is a ripoff. Um, and there should be more vocational training. And it seems to me that's what the debate is going on right now. And I say you can actually neutralize that debate by, by saying it should be addressed through wages. And then you give people uh, the right to say they want to go to college or not, 
they don't want to go to college. But it seems to me the problem is wages and the lack of private sector unions in this country. Oh, okay. No disagreement with you. That's, that's, that's something I would subscribe to also. <laughs> I, I don't think it's, uh, I don't think these are mutually exclusive uh, uh, approaches to the question. Is this so? Okay. Um, first, let me just say, I totally agree with everything you say. I think it's wonderful to hear it put so programmatically, right? And to see this kind of movement for a, an actual action that people can take. Uh, but I have a question about tactics, um, which is to say how we kind of represent our solidarity with this act, right? Mm -hmm. So we're at this point where we're sort of transitioning between, right, we, we have on the one hand the growth of the financial sector and the decline of the labor movement, right, as forces in American politics. Um, and so we have this transition in kind of jubilee tactics, right, um, which you called a debt strike. But my question is, if a strike is a kind of localized act, right, it takes place at a particular place in public, right? And so participants in a strike can kind of represent themselves in public. And the other kind of consequence of that is, is when a strike gets broken, that too is a kind of public act. Whereas kind of debt payments and debt enforcement is something that happens in the dark, basically, right? It's very private. Mm -hmm. So my question is how do, I mean, assuming one million people did sign this, how would we know that? How would that actually, like, come to light in public, and if these people were in some way kind of persecuted for taking this kind of, you know, radical act of political disobedience, how would that come to light as well? Uh-huh. Well, th those are good questions, and I mean, the answer to them really depends on, um, on, um, on the response to the campaign. Uh, we felt our job was to launch the campaign and, and, and put it into the, the, the public eye, and there's, there's, we've gotten a lot of media coverage of it, uh, and we'll continue to roll it out. We've, we've got a tiny group of people. We don't have an office or a staff or anything like that, uh, and it's our contribution uh, really to the Occupy movement. The, the, the strike part of it is, is, is partly rhetorical, um, for, for reasons that are fairly obvious and that you've pointed to. Uh, the public impact and the political impact of it really depends on a, on a lot of things. So I, I, I can't give you the answers to these things because we, we, we've anticipated some of them, but it really depends uh, whether the, the, where the campaign goes. Yeah, sure. I agree with most of what you say. I just want to let everyone know that for Harvard students, there's a nonprofit called Unithrive, and it enables Harvard alums like myself to make interest free loans to Harvard students for room and board. But I don't know if this has gotten much volume to date. Is there a way this could be part of the solution, or do you think it'd be like a band aid on a huge wound? Oh, you, you mean if, if this became a nationwide practice? Yeah. Um, sounds sounds like a plausible proposition, but I I, I mean Harvard, Harvard alums are are uh, are very well known for uh, for being very generous with um, with their donations. Uh, that's that's not a, a kind of generosity that's often matched, and it's an institutionally framed genera form of generosity, a uh, particular kind of philanthropy that that is the, the philanthropical act of the affluent. Um, I, I don't, I, I, I'm skeptical about how widely shared that kind of uh, uh, culture of giving might be. Um, but to the degree to which it does fall within uh, the realm of, uh, or potentially fall within the realm of philanthropy, uh, it, 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 is, it, it, it might be seen as something that is a diversion from what is a principled uh, consensus that that educa higher education should be a right and a public good and that it should be publicly funded rather than, you know, through some channels that are philanthropical, could be construed as philanthropical.
What do you say to the uh, person like the bartender I was speaking with about your being here and encouraging him to come, um, who said, look, I worked my way uh, through the extension school at Harvard, and I didn't take on loans that I'm now going to be asking for forgiveness for. Um, so why give privileged people loan forgiveness? And I said, well, they're not all privileged. Um, but why give privileged people loan forgiveness when I worked my butt off to get through and um, how do we take that into account when building up the political movement that I think you're ta that I think is a fantastic thing that you're uh, promoting? I, I think the principle of free education. I mean, for me personally, the principle of free public education is the bedrock of this, and uh, and and to some degree, we're we're really building off a campaign that was launched with, by the Labour Party a few years ago. I don't know if you heard about it, but this was a campaign that Adolf Reed and others were involved in in the Labour Party. Uh, for free public education. We've used a lot of their data, and to some degree, what we're doing is, is, is you, and that was immensely um, uh, popular at the local level within the trade union movement, uh, that campaign, incidentally. All we're doing really is, is joining that with the amount of energy and occupy-based energy around student debt uh, to make this a, a, a political force for mobilization, but I think I think your response to him, that we're really not talking about necessarily privileged people here. I mean, we're, we're talking about a demographic that is mass higher education in this country, unlike in many other countries, where a much smaller percentage uh, of the population uh, goes to college. This is mass higher education, and if you're, if you're looking at commun two-year community colleges, which are pretty much open access, this is a, this is a working class, um, uh, this is a working class demographic. It's not only a working class demographic, but there's a huge part of it that is working class. That your children, that your children will will enjoy free public education if this campaign is successful. <laughs>